um, our, our kind of standard disclaimer language, uh, I need to make it clear to everybody that um, these webinars um, uh, do not um, do not mean that Grain Show or EPA endorses particular products or companies. Um, the information in the webinar is from the presenters, so it, it's not verified, you know, by us or anything like that. Um, and opinions um, of the presenters are their own. Uh, and also just a little reminder, you know, we're all, I know you all as participants and, and the presenters here that do this, and me too, um, we're certainly not webinaring um, experts. So um, just, um, you know, keep that in mind. These, these certainly aren't the fanciest webinars, but um, our purpose is, is education. Um, just as a little reminder, the Green Show Partnership has three main programs. The webinar series is part of the Advanced Refrigeration Program. So our purpose is to, uh, with that program, is to further environmental best practices, advanced refrigeration technologies, and environmentally friendly uh, refrigerant use. So our speaker today is Travis Lumpkin, who works for Hussman. Um, he's the Director of Sustainability and the Senior Project Leader of Refrigeration Systems at Hussman. And um, we're, we're very uh, thankful to have Travis doing this webinar. And um, welcome, Travis, and, and again, welcome to all of the participants. So uh, let me just hand over here to, uh, to Travis, and then he'll, he'll be able to get started on the presentation. Thank you, Keely. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Today we're going to be covering a very introductory level review of refrigeration. Uh, again, it's tailored for the non-technical professional in order to help those that are involved with refrigeration, uh, either from a procurement standpoint, ownership standpoint, uh, better understand some of the things uh, that we've been talking about over the last few years with refrigeration system uh, designs and, and equipment, we'll just kind of touch base on some of the fundamentals around the refrigeration process and cycle, uh, just to give everybody good uh, grounding. So it will be a very basic introduction to some of the terms and definitions of uh, used in refrigeration, what the system or refrigeration cycle looks like and how it works, and then the basic components that are used uh, to make up a refrigeration cycle. <clears throat> Travis, sorry uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I'm not sure why this has never happened before, but also on the other slides, the system seems to be changing bullet points, you know, or, or dashes or whatever into the number four with a circle around it. Yes, yeah, um, yeah, so I, I apologize for that. I don't know why it's happening. Um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, but <clears throat> so we'll ignore the number four. If, if anywhere in here there's a four, which I don't think there is, I'll call out attention to it. So, okay, thanks. So we'll just ignore that at the time. So we'll cover these these three main topics on the on the discussion. So we'll start with uh, definitions and terms. The first half of this uh, webinar will be definitions and terms. It's kind of like a classroom setting. It's probably the most boring aspect of it, but we do need to understand some of the terms that are used in discussing refrigeration cycles and what they mean. Uh, but once we get past that and we start looking at cycles, it'll uh, hopefully liven up just a little bit more. But <clears throat> heat transfer is, is exactly what we're talking about. Refrigeration is basically uh, the process of removing heat, uh, and it's a part of the thermodynamic uh, branch of sciences. Uh, that is concerned with heat and forms of energy and work. And uh, with refrigeration, there is work being done in order to move heat. So energy is not uh, energy is not created. It's it we transfer energy from from one point or another. Um, a lot of people have the conception that we're moving cold air around or uh, producing cold air. That's not uh, the uh, reality with refrigeration, we're actually 
we're removing the heat. And as a result of the absence of heat, uh, we have colder temperatures. So we'll talk a little bit about heat and work. Um, heat is energy produced or transferred from one body to another. And we do measure that in terms of BTUs. I'll explain a little bit later uh, some of the defi or terms that come up in our definitions, such as BTUs, so I'll, I'll define that a little bit later. And then work. You mentioned work earlier. It's a form of energy transfer done by or on a system. So to better um, illustrate this uh, um, concept of heat and work, I use the basic Carnot engine, uh, modern Carnot engine here where we have heat on the left-hand side. I'll point to it with a, with a pointer. Uh, in this area here, we have high temperature heat. And that heat is transferred through some medium, uh, typically a working fluid. And as a result of that heat moving through the body um, toward a cold area, we will remove that heat energy in the form of work. And we'll do something with that. Uh, so we'll remove the heat in the form of work. And as a result of the absence of heat, we'll have uh, a cold fluid or a cold uh, media that will go to our cold sink. So we're going from a hot, what we refer to as a hot sink in the cycle to a cold sink, and either work would be done on or by that system. So the work should be a little bit of a foundation in understanding refrigeration. We're not just, uh, a fluid is not circulating through uh, supermarket display cases and through the, the system on its own. Uh, they're, we're using uh, power or some form of work to create uh, the temperature difference, which will drive that working fluid from one point to the other. So let's talk about types of heat. Uh, there's two basic types of heat we'll be dealing with. One is what we call sensible heat, and that is heat added to or removed from a substance of the body that produces a change in temperature. And when a change in temperature occurs, we know that because uh, heat has either been added or removed. And when we see that uh, heat has been added or removed through, like a, a thermometer, uh, we'll know that the uh, sensible heat has been transferred. Uh, we refer to that basically as detectable heat, something that you can measure. Uh, it's sensible. You can feel it. Uh, latent heat, which is another concept we'll talk a little bit about, is the amount of heat added to or removed from the substance to produce a change in phase. <clears throat> Just a little bit later in the, in the webinar, I'll explain and illustrate what a phase change is. Um, but with a uh, latent heat, whether it be added or removed, we do not see a change in temperature uh, that's detectable with, with a thermometer. Uh, we refer to this, uh, another way to refer to latent heat is hidden heat. So we have two forms of heat, the sensible, which is detectable, you can measure it with a thermometer, and then we have latent heat, which is hidden or not detectable, uh, which is used to produce a phase, phase uh, change in phase. So let's, I'm going to spend just a, a couple of minutes around what latent heat is. Uh, it's kind of hard to understand how you can have heat and you not be able to detect it. Uh, so what is going on? So to illustrate this, <clears throat> I'm going to use this diagram that uh, uh, pictorially represents uh, the change in phase of, of one pound of ice, which is on the lower left-hand corner here. We have an ice cube, which is uh, representative of one pound mass of ice. And we're going to walk through uh, the phase change and the heat transfer, both sensible and latent, to the point where we have steam. So if we start over here at, at uh, the reference point zero, we have ice that is below the freezing point, so it's a, a complete solid. And we're going to add heat uh, from uh, reference point zero to one. And in this heat addition, it's sensible heat. The reason why we know it's sensible heat is we're able to detect it on the left-hand scale or 
where the temperature scale is, so it's removing from a reference point of zero degrees Fahrenheit to the reference point of 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And in order to increase that temperature of the ice from zero degrees Fahrenheit to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it required the addition of 16 BTUs or British thermal units. Again, I'll explain that to you in just a few minutes. But that's a measure of heat. Uh, um, that's how we measure heat, uh, other than uh, temperature. So 16 BTUs are added to the one pound of ice, and we bring it up to 32 degrees. <clears throat> so at this point, if we add any additional heat, the ice will start to liquefy. <clears throat> if we remove any heat, the, the ice will remain a solid. So with that, <clears throat> it's at the... Uh, uh, the critical point uh, between phase change. So at this point, and for this illustration, we're going to continue adding heat to the ice. And uh, while that ice is a changing state from a solid to a liquid, uh, there's the heat addition, which is not detected on a thermometer, but it requires the addition of 144 BTUs to transform all the solid ice to 100% water, uh, which is right over here at the state three. So that is how we add heat, and that, that heat addition of 144 BTUs is latent heat. It's not detectable uh, on the thermometer scale, but it's the continued, continued addition of heat into that uh, block of ice, and as a result of that continuation of adding heat, that block of ice will melt to a, a solid liquid. Now, at state three, we have a 100% um, saturated, uh, or we have solid liquid, or a, a body of liquid, one pound of liquid. And at this point, if we continue to add heat, now that is 100% uh, liquid and no more solids, we will see a change in uh, temperature from 32 degrees up to the boiling point at 212 degrees. So to boil that liquid uh, to a vapor, bring it to the point uh, that the liquid is 100% um, saturated, uh, we're going to add 180 BTUs of, of energy to state four. So here we have a 100% saturated liquid. So what that means is, is that this water is saturated with heat to the point that any removal of that heat will cause the liquid to cool off uh, below the boiling point, and any addition of heat, which again is a latent heat, will cause the water to boil and start to change into a vapor. Uh, so it takes 970 BTUs to convert that 100% saturated liquid to 100% vapor. And as a, again, you notice that there's no change in temperature. So this is the difference between sensible heat and latent heat. And uh, one point that is very important in refrigeration is this heat, uh, this latent heat. And we have 970 BTUs that can be added or removed without a change in temperature versus 180 degrees that it takes to change from a, a, a liquid to a saturated liquid. So this is very important to us. We want to use this heat, this latent heat, um, for our benefit. So one, again, the takeaway on this slide is the effective temperature rise is minimal versus that change in phase. A lot of heat energy is used when we change phase. So the types of latent heat, uh, we have latent heat of vaporization, which I'll go back. That was here, where we're going from the liquid to the vapor, and then vice versa, the, the heat of condensation. So the latent heat of vaporization is the amount of that heat that's necessary to change that liquid to a vapor with no change in temperature. So an easy way to remember latent heat of vaporization is change from liquid to vapor. Just use the L from latent and the V from vaporization, and that's it. Keely, are you hearing that music? I am. Um, I'm, someone, I think, has put 
their phone on mute while uh, while they were listening to the webinar. Um, let me uh, let me try again here. I, I did mute everybody's lines. Let me see if muting everybody's lines. Oh, there we. Go. Oh no, it's still there. Let me see if muting everybody's lines will get rid of that again. And after I mute everybody's lines, Travis, you're going to have to press pound six again. Okay. So. The leader has unmuted your line. The leader has muted your line. To unmute your line, press pound six. Okay, Travis, if you press pound six now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, so we're back on. So late heat of vaporization is changing from the, the heat added uh, with no change in temperature to change from the liquid to the vapor. And then vice versa, the uh, latent heat of condensation is the amount of heat without a change in temperature required to change from a vapor to a liquid. Those are two terms that are often used in refrigeration uh, and the analysis of it uh, that are very important uh, to understand. So let's walk through the phase change. So this is trying to pictorially represent uh, what we mean by phase change and give a little uh, uh, terms for that. So if we start at the left, uh, the left is representing vapor and uh, we'll go through the top line. So if we go from a vapor, uh, the, the change from vapor to a liquid is referred to as condensation. Um, from a liquid to a solid is referred to as solidification. And if you save this uh, webinar for the future, I use the color blue because heat is being removed and as a result we're cooling uh, the vapor to a liquid to a solid. And um, that's how, uh, that's basically what those terms represent. On the flip side, if we go the opposite way, by adding heat, we'll change a solid uh, represented by the ice cubes uh, to a liquid and that's called melting. And then uh, continuing adding heat will um, boil off that liquid. We refer to that as evaporation uh, to the point where it's a vapor again. You can go directly from a vapor to a solid and vice versa directly from a solid to a vapor uh, and bypass the liquid phase. Those two phase changes are, are, are referred to as deposition, going from a vapor to a solid, and sublimation going from a solid to a vapor. Not typically seen in a refrigeration system unless there's a catastrophic failure or something of that nature, but those are just for everybody's uh, uh, benefit. You can go from uh, the end state of a vapor to a solid and vice versa and bypass the liquid phase. And we talked about uh, heat. Uh, one thing that we do need to uh, be aware of is what does that heat transfer look like in, in reality in action. So to use, that, uh, uh, use the picture of a pot of boiling water where heat is being added from a flame and there's various different touch points in there. Uh, so we'll start uh, with convection. Convection is basically uh, uh, what I refer to as heat transfer through indirect contact. Uh, convection is happening here and the transfer of heat from one place to another by the movement of fluids. So if you can picture uh, this pot of water and it's uh, heat being added and it's boiling so you have uh, water vapor uh, and water all in the same uh, container. Uh, heat is being transferred uh, from the source and this working fluid uh, in the, this case would be water, and that heat transfer is referred to as the term convection. Uh, convection, I like to think of convection as a heat transfer through direct contact, and that's exactly what it is. It's heat transfer from one solid body in contact with another. So if you've ever grabbed a, a hold of a hot pan or a, a hot pot, uh, that heat transfer from that pot to your hand was 
by conduction. You're in direct contact from a solid body to another solid body. And the last form of heat transfer is the thermal radiation, which is uh, pictured here. Uh, you do not see the radiation uh, coming from the flame, but there are charged particles that move through space and they can increase the, the temperature of the body. So it's a sensible heat transfer uh, in the form of radiation. One thing to uh, keep in mind, or a, a, a fundamental uh, way to remember a heat transfer, heat always moves from the hot source to the cold source. Uh, so if you ever remember as a child standing in front of a refrigerator and your mom telling you, uh, don't stand in front of the refrigerator with the door open, you're letting all the cold air out, uh, she was partially right, she just didn't realize it, but uh, actually you're letting heat in. Uh, but there is a little spillage, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's one of the fundamental uh, takeaway here is remembering that heat moves from the hot source to the cold source. So we mentioned a, a few things earlier on about temperature, pressure, and BTU, so it's a good point uh, here to um, define what those are. Temperature is the measure of that heat, uh, either of the object or substance that's being added. In the um, English units, what we, or in, at least in the U.S., what we refer to uh, temperature as is in units of Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. In the uh, metric system, uh, temperature is referred to in degrees Celsius. On the pressure side, uh, it's the force per unit area, or what we call pounds per square inch, that's applied to the surface of an object. Uh, we do look at pressure, and I'll explain the relationship of pressure and temperature with one another re relative to refrigerant in just a few moments. But these two measures, temperature and pressure, can tell a lot about what's going on inside the system. Much like if you went to a doctor and they took your blood pressure and they took your body temperature, a doctor would use those two measurements to uh, try to detect what may be going on in your body. But it gives them a good foundational reference point of the stability of, of what's going on. We do the same thing in refrigeration. We need to know the temperature and we need to know the pressure. And as a result of those two, th uh, two measures, uh, we can make some uh, educated calculations and determination of, what, of what's going on. And then uh, I used the term British thermal unit earlier, or BTU, and that's the amount of heat. Uh, the, the definition of BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water, which is about one pint uh, for, for reference point, uh, raise that one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So that's by definition what a BTU is. And to give you a reference point of, you know, what, what does that look like or you know, how can I better understand that? Uh, it has been approximated that the heat energy produced from a single wooden match is about the same amount of energy as one BTU. So that kind of gives you a, a, a reference point of what a BTU, a single BTU would be. Just a few more terms and we're done with the um, definition side. Uh, other things that you'll hear in the refrigeration cycle or discussion is enthalpy, Mass flow, net refrigeration tank, these are three very important terms. Uh, enthalpy is the measure of heat energy of a substance. So we, uh, we're using refrigerants or glycol or, or CO2 or other media refrigerants uh, to transfer heat from one place to another. And we measure that heat energy of that substance. And that term is called enthalpy. Uh, we are very interested in the change in that enthalpy uh, as we're looking at a refrigeration cycle. And that is measured in British thermal units or BTUs per pound. And pound is, again, reference to the working fluid that we're, we're using. And mass flow rate is basically the amount of refrigerant or working fluid that's flowing through your system. And we measure that in pounds per hour. And that term pounds, uh, I guess it would be natural for you and I to think of weight, uh, pounds in, in a, a physical form, you know, something, we have a 100-pound weight uh, of, a, of something. 
we refer to this in pound mass, so density of the fluid is important. Uh, and we try to take out the, the uh, force of gravity when we're, we're looking at this. So we're not looking at it from a force as much as it is a quantitative amount of fluid that we're trying to measure. And then that refrigeration effect, which is basically the evaporator effect on a system. How much heat are we removing? What is that refrigeration effect that we're getting, the cooling, I guess you could say, uh, uh, that we're getting from the refrigeration system that we're talking about? So these are all important terms, um, fundamental terms in refrigeration systems. And the last two terms we'll cover are superheat and subcool. Uh, these probably are built uh, for the layman or are, are a little like latent heat. It's something that's kind of difficult to understand if you, if you don't quite uh, get it, but superheat is the amount of sensible heat over and above a vapor's evaporation point. So basically what that means is if we evaporate completely uh, uh, one pound of water into a vapor and we continue to add heat, that is sensible heat, not latent heat, but we continue to add additional heat to that uh, vapor, that's called superheat. And we, it's important to us because that's the amount of heat we have to remove to bring it to the point where we can actually condense it. Uh, and then we actually have to remove the heat for, for condensing. And then subcooled is any liquid which is below its saturation temperature. So we, when we use that uh, illustration of one pound of ice that uh, we went through the different phase changes from a solid to a liquid to a vapor. Our reference point for that pound of ice was zero degrees Fahrenheit. So it was actually uh, subcooled below its freezing point, which was 32 degrees. So we actually had to add, uh, I believe the number was 16 BTUs, to bring it up to that point where it was at its melting point. The subcooled is any, anything uh, below its, in, in the case of this, we're looking at liquid. So water, at uh, room temperature, 75 degrees or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's subcooled uh, below its boiling point of 212 degrees. So now that we, we, we've talked about all these different terms um, that are very important in a refrigeration system and understanding heat transfer and uh, heat movement and, and measurements, you know, what are we going to do with that? So the rest of this, this presentation, we'll try to focus on tying all these terms and these concepts together in what we, you, what we refer to as a, refriger, a mechanical refrigeration cycle. So you see here we talked about heat energy and sensible heat and latent heat that is measured in terms of BTUs. And all that heat, different types of heat are transferred. The transfer of that heat is, if you remember, through conduction, uh, convection, and radiation. And we have terms like pressure and temperature, which are monitoring the system. We have superheat, which is above and beyond the vapor temperature. We have subcooled, which is the, temp uh, the amount of uh, de delta in temperature below the uh, vapor point of, of the liquid, or the liquid point. Uh, of, a, of a substance, and then saturation, we referred to that earlier with the saturated vapor, where it was saturated with as much heat as possible at the point from starting to convert it from a liquid uh, to a vapor. Now we're going to take all this and, and use a uh, work to move that heat around, and that's a refrigeration cycle. So we'll look at things like compressors and condensers and evaporators and even expansion devices to illustrate how we move heat from one place to another. When, uh, before we actually look at a, a, a PH diagram, one thing to uh, remember, uh, one thing that we need to establish uh, is uh, that pressure-temperature uh, relationship. I mentioned earlier when we define pressure and temperature that they, are, they can be used to determine what's going on inside the system, much like your blood pressure and body temperature can help a doctor determine what's going on. So I used R4 for a, uh, and this is a pressure temperature chart. We have pressure on the left-hand side, and we have temperature on the uh, bottom scale, the x-axis. 
and I just used a uh, curve for R404A, uh, which is a pretty common refrigerant that's uh, used in supermarket refrigeration today. So if we take a couple of reference points, so around 100 degrees, uh, we have a pressure of just under 250 pounds per square inch gauge. And zero, around zero degrees, we're just under 50 pounds. So as the pressure is increased or reduced, the temperature will increase or reduce likewise. So if we were to take R404A, uh, just under 250 pounds or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and we reduce that pressure to just under 50 pounds, we can bring that temperature of our 404A from around 100 degrees Fahrenheit down to around zero degrees Fahrenheit. So knowing the pressure and temperature in the working fluid inside your system will help establish what's going on um, inside, the, inside the system. So a change in pressure results in a change in temperature. So here's a, a pressure enthalpy diagram. Um, this is very fundamental and important in, in the cycle. We're, we're gonna, this, the arrows represent the refer, uh, what's going on in the system. And there's four basic components in a refrigeration system. Uh, there's the compressor. There's a condenser. And I'll show you what these look like in a few minutes. An expansion device and an evaporator. And we've already talked about enthalpy, and we've already talked about pressure. So one thing that's very uh, fundamental in a refrigeration system analysis is the relationship of pressure to enthalpy, and we refer to that as a pH diagram. This black curve right here is representative of the properties of the refrigerant at different pressures and enthalpy. So if you have an R4 for a refrigerant, you'll have a bell curve like this. If you have a 134A system, it's going to have a similar curve, but the pressures and enthalpy will be different from one another uh, because they're based on the properties of that refrigerant. And we're going to start here and walk through the cycle um, uh, in this pH diagram before we start looking at some of the components. So if we start right here at the reference point where you see the red laser point, uh, that's at the suction side or inlet side of the compressor. So what the compressor does is it will increase the pressure from a specific reference point, whatever the inlet pressure is. It's going to add work to the form of a motor driving the piston inside the compressor. And it's going to increase that pressure in that uh, compressor from a low pressure to a high pressure represented from the red, uh, blues to the red and we'll raise the pressure of that uh, refrigerant. And it, it has certain properties at, at this point. And this region outside the curve is vapor. It's uh, the vapor portion of the refrigerant. And we'll reject that heat into a condenser. So that condenser is going to take the heat energy that's in this refrigerant from this point and it's going to reject that to some other uh, media that's at a uh, lower temperature. In this case, uh, most system, most people are familiar with an air-cooled condenser, which rejects heat into the ambient air. Uh, so heat, uh, the working fluid, which contains the heat, will pass through that condenser. And this region right here we refer to as superheat. It's the heat above this vaporization line. So that condenser, represented here, will remove the superheat to the point that it hits that 100% uh, saturated vapor line, and any additional heat removed will cause that vapor to start to condense. So in here, we have a mixture of liquid and vapor in the, uh, in the tubes or in the pipes in the working fluid. So the additional removal of heat from that working fluid will bring us to a point where at the saturation line between a liquid and vapor to a solid liquid. So everything to the left of this curve is solid liquid. And typically, uh, we will remove more heat than what is necessary to, to saturate the uh, liquid, to have saturated liquid, and we refer to that again as subcooling. So we have subcooled liquid at a given pressure 
for the given uh, entropy. We will use an expansion device, and as you see here, the expansion device's purpose is to change that pressure from a high pressure point to a low pressure point. We'll back up one slide real quick. Remember, if we go from a high pressure point to a low pressure point, and we know the physical properties of the refrigerant, we can reduce that temperature from one point to another. So that's what this expansion device does. It reduces the pressure. So we have a high pressure inlet, and by reducing that pressure, um, we will reduce its temperature. And in this case, we're going from a uh, saturated liquid to a mixture of liquid and vapor because of the properties of that specific type of refrigerant and the uh, pressure that that refrigerant is, is going to be at. So we have a reduced liquid uh, vapor mixture at a lower temperature. That refrigerant is going to pass through the evaporator. That evaporator is typically in it, like in a display case. And that's where the cooling is going to take place. Warm air is going to be absorbed into the cold refrigerant. The refrigerant is below the air temperature, so heat travels from the hot source to the cold source. So that's how we get the heat to move from the ambient into the working fluid of the refrigerant because it's much colder than the ambient air. And that liquid is going to start heating up. Uh, even though it's at a very low temperature, it's, uh, at that particular pressure, it will heat up and absorb that heat to the point where we uh, are a fully saturated vapor and then we'll compress that saturated vapor and the cycle will start all over again. So these are very, this is a very fundamental uh, diagram that's used for analysis and design of systems. That's something very uh, good to understand for a refrigeration cycle, the relationships of pressure and enthalpy and pressure and temperature and how the cycle works. So now if we spend just a minute looking at what that would look like inside a refrigeration cycle, I have here uh, a, a, a piping diagram, a pictorial diagram of what you would see in, like in a supermarket system. The boxes represent a piece of equipment. So there's typically a piece of equipment uh, that contains the compressor. So we have a compressor that will bring in uh, low temperature vapor, low pressure vapor, that compressor is going to compress that gas, and it's going to push that working fluid to a condenser, which is represented here. That condenser is going to remove heat by forcing a lower temperature air across the coil to reject the heat out of the, uh, uh, help improve the heat transfer out of the refrigerant. Again, heat goes from the hot source to the cold source. And by passing that refrigerant through this condenser, we will remove enough heat to change that vapor into a liquid. And at this point, it's a high-pressure liquid. So that's how it continues to flow. So this high-pressure liquid will continue through the piping network to the display case, which is represented by this block right here. The display case contains an expansion device, an expansion valve, which will reduce the pressure from the inlet to the outlet. So we have a high-pressure liquid. And as a result, we will get that liquid vapor mixture coming out of the pro, uh, expansion valve. That liquid vapor mixture will continue to pass through the evaporator tube bundle, and we'll use a fan to uh, help the heat transfer, improve the heat transfer by forcing the warmer air across that coil. And as a result, the refrigerant will heat up and absorb the uh, heat from the ambient air or the air that's being blown across it to the point that that liquid will boil off into a vapor, and then that vapor continues over to the compressor. And here's the uh, pH diagram to help remind us. So this portion of compression is over here um, on section one. The condenser, which is again is a mechanical device with a tube bundle and a, and a fan, is represented here where we're removing, that, uh, removing the heat out of the high pressure vapor. The expansion device here, and so how we move the, uh, uh, from a high pressure uh, to a lower pressure. And then the evaporator coil is where we absorb the heat out of the space that we're cooling, and that refrigerant flows back up to the compressor. So this is a very fundamental, typical vapor compression uh, cycle. So we'll talk real quick on the four basic components that we just showed you in the cycle, the compressor, the condenser, and the evaporator, 
and then we'll have a few minutes for um, some questions. So the compression cycle, I'm, I'm showing here a typical um, piston uh, type uh, compressor. So we have moving pistons, which here we have vapor, which goes into the inlet uh, suction side of the compressor, and this works very much like a car engine would. So on the downstroke, the low pressure vapor is pulled into the chamber uh, or the cylinder to the point where we hit the um, bottom end of the stroke of the, of the cylinder. And on the upward stroke of the cylinder, we're going to compress that vapor, which was contained inside the cylinder, to the point where we hit the uh, top or the top dead center of the, the stroke of the cylinder. And then that high pressure vapor wakes it out the uh, outlet side of the compressor. So from a pressure standpoint, here's a couple of examples. We'll pull in, for instance, 40 uh, pounds or 40 pounds per square inch vapor into our chamber, and then we'll push that vapor out on the upstroke of the, of the cylinder. So we're taking the gas that has been contained in this larger volume of, a, of the cylinder, and we're reducing that volume of that cylinder considerably. And as a result, we're going to compress that gas and its pressure is going to increase significantly and allow us to push that working fluid throughout our system. So that's this portion right here of our vapor compression refrigeration cycle. On the condenser side, this is a picture of a typical condenser, air cool condenser used in a supermarket. And I mentioned earlier that it is a tube by Nord. It has several tubes or chambers inside the condenser by which the refrigerant will pass through as a vapor to the point that enough heat can be removed from that vapor to liquefy it and, and change states to the liquid. Uh, there's two bundles and fins that increase the heat transfer. The fans uh, used are to pull the ambient air up and across those two bundles to reject that uh, heat out to the ambient side and increase the uh, efficiency of the of the condenser. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll take superheated vapor, which is vapor with more heat added to it, bring it down to the condensing line all the way across the, uh, the vapor dome of the refrigerant so we have 100% liquid and then we'll slightly subcool that. The expansion device, which is again typically installed at the evaporator. It does have to be within close proximity to improve the effectiveness of it. It, it does a couple things. Uh, the primary purpose of it is to create that pressure difference uh, to allow the high pressure of liquid, uh, going across the scale here, to a lower pressure and reduce that temperature. So it will create that pressure difference in, a, uh, in the refrigerant. It also regulates the flow. It will actually regulate the amount of refrigerant that feeds into that evaporator tube bundle. And the way we typically use it inside of supermarket refrigeration is we, we want to maintain uh, this superheat coming out of the evaporator for a couple of reasons. One is to make sure that we fully remove the, uh, the fully absorb or remove the latent heat inside that evaporator and got the most effect, efficient and effective use of the coil. And two, we want to make sure we protect the compressor. Uh, it's important to know that we do not compress liquids. We only compress vapors. And there's a couple different types of expansion valves that are shown here. We use, there's a thermostatic expansion valve, which is a mechanical valve. And there's an electronic expansion valve, which is controlled with a, uh, some algorithms and a, and a motor. They both do the same, uh, they both achieve the same end result. It's just two different types of control for uh, creating that pressure difference.